Welcome to our Green Chair Conversations Lent series. Today we have the Reverend Dorothy Sanders Wells from St. George's Episcopal Church. Dorothy Wells is a Mobile, Alabama native who came to Memphis when she began her undergraduate studies at Rhodes College. She received her Bachelor of Arts degree in vocal performance from Rhodes, her Juris Doctor degree from the Cecil C. Humphreys School of Law at the University of Memphis, her Master of Divinity degree from Memphis Theological Seminary and her Doctor of Ministry degree from Candler School of Theology at Emory University. Prior to Dorothy's ordination as a priest, she was a practicing attorney in Memphis for nearly 18 years. Dorothy is the chair of the Board of Directors of Metropolitan Interfaith Association, MIFA, and a member of the Board of Directors of Church Health. Dorothy's credentials are quite impressive, equaled with her commitment and dedication to St. George's and the city of Memphis. In this episode, Dorothy offers a fresh look at faith, at Lent, and at prayer, while offering some incredibly relevant lessons she has learned along the way. So get ready to take notes. Dorothy is so, so full of wisdom and challenges for us today. So let's get to it and meet Dorothy Wells in The Green Chair. Thank you so much for being here with us today in the green chair. I am so honored to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Yes, this is such a blessing. So I, I would love for you to just kind of dive in and share a little bit about yourself. So introduce our people to who you are. I mean, you are the rector at St. George's Episcopal Church, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, how many years? I've been there for seven years. This oh, is wow. my eighth year now. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, you, not a born and raised Memphis? No. From Mobile, Alabama, actually, okay. and came here to go to college at Rhodes okay. and never left. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. And then uh, tell me a little bit about your journey. You have, I, I, when we were talking the other day, I just kind of dove in on this because I think it's so fascinating. So you were a practicing attorney for 18 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then now you're a priest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little unique. Um, tell us how you got there. Well, actually, I could I could go back a little farther than that and tell you that I was a music major in college. Oh, and, okay. And fancied that one day I might be singing on the Metropolitan Opera stage. That didn't kind of work okay. out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hence, I went to law school and became yes. a practicing attorney. Yes. Um, and... You know, I, I, I guess you could say I've always been a church person. Okay. Um, my family is a church family. Okay. So I grew up in the church and spent an enormous amount of time in church as a kid. Um, I swore when I graduated from high school that I was done with that and <laughs> um, was going to find some other ways to live through life and ended up at a Presbyterian college with a lot of friends who went to church all the time and oh, wow. who were always knocking on my dorm room door on Sunday morning going, why aren't you ready? We're going to church. <laughs> So, um, so I, I really have spent much of my life in church. Mm -hmm. um, so it, I, I think that my husband wasn't terribly surprised. Um, <laughs> at the end of it all, I think he wasn't terribly surprised that um, someone who had really grown up in church and really had a strong attachment to church and religion um, might have a calling to do something else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was it was. A big Not, jump. It was a big jump. It was well, a big jump. So, so you graduate from Rhodes with a vocal vocal performance major. Is that mm -hmm. what it was? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you graduate and you go to law school or how? how? I actually worked for a few years. Okay. Um, um, I started working for a regional employee benefits consulting firm and thought, I kind of like this. I mean, I, I kind of like the, the puzzle of helping people um, address needs in their businesses. Um, so I thought, this is kind of cool. If I, if I went to law school, then I would be able to do this even better. Mm -hmm. And so that was what I practiced as an attorney. I was an employee okay. benefits lawyer. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, and lots of fun. I mean, like, because it is kind of a big puzzle. Uh, how do you put things together for employers yes. that really meet their employees' needs? Yes. And uh, I'm moving back. Sorry. Um, you're married. You said you mentioned your husband. And you yes. Have two, two daughters. Two daughters. How old are they now? They are 27 and 24 now. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. So you make this pivot. Tell me about your family at this point. I mean, how old are your kids? Like, this is a big change from from your, you were talking about your schedule and your family structures and then all of a sudden you're changing to say 
I'm going to go pursue uh, to, to become a priest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so at the time that I entered the ordination process in our diocese, a um, little background, uh, a diocese is kind of the, a, a geographic grouping yes. of you. churches. Um, and our bishop at the time, uh, when I entered the ordination process, um, was um, wonderful and very supportive. And I had a 14-year-old and an 11-year-old, I guess, mm. about, about those ages. And I was fully prepared for him to tell me, because normally we go away to seminary. Like, that's, that's our norm, is we go away to an Episcopal seminary and work for Okay. those three years. Okay. And I was fully prepared for him to say, this can wait until you are able to do that because we really were not in a place to uproot everybody and, and move. And so my husband and I were talking and it was like, so yeah, when our younger daughter graduates from high school, if that's what we have to do, we, we can make that work when she graduates from high school. And, and, and in the meantime, you know, I can be doing whatever the bishop wants me to do um, to be getting ready. And he was like, no, we, we, we're going to send you to seminary locally <laughs> right now. We will figure out your Anglican studies piece, but we're going to go ahead and let you go to seminary locally wow. um, because there's no reason for us not to let you do that, which was wonderful of him and very gracious of him. And one of the things I think you touched on, which I loved, is that uh, you said it's actually almost going back 10 years where you really started sensing mm -hmm. before making that big transition and making that move is oh, yeah. you sensed, okay, God is really pressing me on, on this. I'd love for you to explain that because I think that was a really pivotal. Yes, um, God is really loud and God is really insistent. Th those have been my words um, since all this happened because um, we were living life and, and I was a very involved church person. So I felt like I am giving back, very involved in community things as well. Um, I had found kind of my niche in some community ministries. So I felt like, you know, I am, I am giving back to the world in very meaningful ways. And, and God is loud and God is insistent and, and God just, I just kept feeling that mm. finger tap. And I thought, that can't be me because I don't feel equipped. I don't, I don't feel equipped to do that. I don't feel equipped to be a pastor who walks alongside someone when they're grieving. I don't feel equipped to be the pastor who is responding to those kinds of needs with people in my flock. I just don't feel equipped to do that. And um, I don't know. I was actually having a conversation with a college friend and it just hit me that what God wants you to do, God will figure out the way hmm. for you to do. That's good. Yeah. Um, and I just continued to go back to the text from the first chapter of Jeremiah where God tells Jeremiah, I'm going to put my words in your mouth. I'm going to give you what you need. Hmm. Um, and I thought, I need to stop stressing about this mm. because if God wants me to do this, mm. God will equip me with what I need. And the other part of that passage you, you were talking about too is that in Jeremiah, he, he keeps saying, well, don't say you're too young. Don't, don't say you're just a boy. Don't say you're a boy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kind of all the excuses of, mm -hmm. yeah, I thought that was really, really powerful as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's really, really. And I think um, w one of the one of the things you had said is just about the um, obedience in it and, and even just teaching your children of like, this isn't necessarily what they, at one point, what they wanted, but it's teaching teaching your family like. This is how we obey God. Yeah. Um, and, and my daughters certainly, I mean, one of my daughters is planning to start med school this hmm. year. The other one has an undergraduate degree in engineering and she's working as a recruiter right now. And you know, th this is not the life that they necessarily will be called to lead, but they'll still be called to lead faithful lives. Mm -hmm. um, whatever it is that God wants them to do, they'll be called to lead very faithful lives doing it. And I wanted to be able to demonstrate that for them, that there is that sense of we do what God asks us to do. Mm. That's good. That's really, really good. Um, and so one of the focuses I had for us in this interview was specifically on Lent and prayer. Uh, it was kind of a conversation we had had. 
And I just love, you are just this wealth of knowledge. <laughs> you, <laughs> number one, you have so many degrees. <laughs> uh, but it's very impressive. It's incredibly impressive. But I, uh, I would love for you to kind of lean in and educate us some on Lent. Um, one of the conversations I had with you was, you know, we're, it's, we're only a few years into really leaning into this Lenten season. Mm-hmm. And so we're learning and growing as a church and as a congregation. So I would love your perspective on what is Lent? Uh, why do we practice it? And I, I think one of the things you touched on in our conversation was biblically and then in the ancient church as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I would love for you to lean into that. Sure. Um, the early church actually um, treated Lent as a time that people would be preparing for baptism. So that was that 40 day period during which you were engaged in prayer and fasting and study and everything that you needed in order that by Easter, you would be ready to be baptized and welcomed into the church. And so this whole idea of resurrection is an idea that everything is made new. Mm -hmm. Everything is alive again and everything is made new. And those 40 days were the, the days during which you grew and grew in your relationship with God to prepare you for what is it with resurrection to literally be raised with Christ as a baptized person and coming into the fold of the church. Because baptism also, for a lot of folks, it was an adult thing. I mean, people were coming to the faith as adults. Yes. It wasn't what we understand yeah. now in our tradition where babies are baptized. Yes. Yeah. It was adult people who were preparing for that, that rite in the church. So what we've done over the course of the years to some extent, I think we, we, we short circuit I agree. what we want to call Lent. And so people just kind of say, oh, well, we'll give up something for Lent. It's not we're going to give up something for Lent. It's, it's only, it only works if you're giving up something in order to take something on. Mm, so like you're, if you're freeing yourself in a way that you say, I'm going to not spend that 20 minutes that I otherwise would be spending getting my Starbucks every morning but I'm gonna be in the scriptures, or I'm going to take that 20 minutes and I'm gonna pray, or I'm gonna take the cumulative total of that time for the week, and I'm gonna go serve at a homeless shelter, or I'm going to go serve meals to people who are hungry. Um, Because the idea isn't just to give something up, the idea is what am I doing that frees me to grow in my relationship with God? Hmm. That's, that's the idea behind Lent. So we, we think of Lent really kind of with three pillars. Um, the pillar of fasting, that idea yeah. of giving something up, but that also that's combined with prayer and almsgiving. Hmm. And almsgiving is how we are giving back into the world. It's not necessarily, oh, I'm giving more to the church. I'm, I'm going to skip my Starbucks and give more to the church. Yeah, that could be what you need to do for almsgiving. Yeah. But it also could be, what I need to do for almsgiving is, yeah, Constance Abbey is downtown, and I need to go and make some lunches for the people at Constance Abbey one day. That's my almsgiving. Or I need to give some time to working a mobile food pantry for Catholic Charities or Mid-South Food Bank um, so that I'm connected to God's people and the needs of God's people in the community. Um, and, and able to see that image and likeness of God more clearly and deeply mm-hmm. in all of the people that I encounter. Mm-hmm. That's good. That's really, really good. And I love you touched on the resurrection piece um, when you were talking about that. Is you were talking about how uh, in our conversation, resurrection is like a breath of new life. Yes. And I loved that. Like that yes. really just stayed with me. Yes, it is. Um, because Jesus had already predicted in the Gospels, he'd already said to the disciples, So this is what's going to happen. I'm going to have to be betrayed and I'm going to have to die. But after three days, I'm coming back. And so this notion that the dead will come back. um, Yeah. (laughs) yeah. (laughs) Um, The notion that there is really going to be new life and God is breathing that new life into us Mm. to be witnesses of the resurrection. John's account of the resurrection story um, is so very powerful because that's the account where it's Mary Magdalene alone who has made her way to the tomb. And 
thinking that Jesus is the gardener. It's like, if you just tell me, just tell me what you did with him. <laughs> I'll take care of it from here. Just, just tell me what you did with him. And he calls her name. Hmm. I mean, it's, it's the most striking account of all of the four gospels, resurrection stories. When he calls her name, Mary, and she knows, she knows who it is. Hmm. She knows what it is. And she sees that new life right in front of her. Hmm. Um, that's, that's that moment. I mean, because we imagine ourselves in that moment of Mary Magdalene hearing Jesus call our names hmm. and seeing him alive and well, even after the world had taken life from him knowing that the world really couldn't take life from him because God had breathed that life back into him and had given him back to the world. Wow. Um, that's the moment. That, mm. that is the moment of just Jesus turning to her and going, Mary. Mm. I love that. I, I have chills. <laughs> and she good. knows, yeah. oh, that's my Lord. Mm. That is my Lord. Um, and that's, that's what this whole time of preparation should be doing for us, is preparing us for that moment hmm. of re-encounter with resurrection re-encounter with Jesus, where we are go <gasps> <sighs> hmm. He's called my name, hmm. and he is right there, hmm. right there. Hmm. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you for that. That is, that is amazing. Uh, so... So what what about for you specifically? Are are you are you doing something are you doing something this Lent season? What does that look like for your church? Talk to me a little bit about that. Well, you know, we've we've had this drought called COVID. <laughs> <laughs> um, which has been just so disruptive. Um, our church is compared to Hope a very small church. <laughs> so very we, we before COVID yes. on any given Sunday morning we probably saw about 240 250 people. Um, so comparatively speaking very small church. Um, but what that it fosters a different kind of sense of community. Yes. And that's all just kind of been disrupted in this COVID world. So I really wanted Lent for our parish family to be um, an intentional walking with God during these 40 days, a con an intentional connecting with one another, um, and looking for ways for us to be very focused on the needs of the world in this time yes. as well. Yes. Um, because there's so many people who are suffering in so many ways that I think we just kind of lose sight mm. Uh, it's not just about sick people, but it's also about our medical professionals who are working hours upon hours upon hours yes. to take yes. care of sick people. Um, our church is right next to Methodist Germantown Hospital. Um, and I mean, I just cruised over to their parking lot one day because people were telling me about how many ambulances were over there at the time. And I just thought, you know, because before COVID, I was over in that hospital so much yes. of the time. Yes. Um, and there were ambulances lined up like it was a war zone. Wow. And they were saying at the time that it was taking six hours for ambulances to offload because there were no rooms in the hospital. There, were no, there, there, was, there was nowhere for anybody to go. So ambulance drivers couldn't offload their patients because there was nowhere in the hospital for them to go. Um, and it's those kinds of needs in the community that I think we have to just stay focused on all the time, is there are sick people, there are medical professionals taking care of those sick people, there are students who are spending way too much time not being calm and and focused on their learning, but being anxious about everything that's going on around them. Mm -hmm. There are teachers who are just now starting to get vaccines, mm -hmm. um, who are anxious about being in classrooms. There are people who have lost their vocations. There are people who've lost their income. Despite the moratoria on evictions, we know that there are people who have lost their housing, um, people who don't have enough to eat. I mean, the, the suffering is well beyond the half million people. Yes whose lives have been lost. Yes. It's, it's, it's everybody else who's been left behind. Yes, absolutely. Um, so it's, it's a horrid, horrid time. 
And I really wanted part of our focus during this Lenten season to remain. We've had prayers every Sunday for kind of all things COVID and, uh, and all the conditions that people are suffering um, during this season in our, our world's existence. And um, we, we, I did a cycle of prayers. Yes. Yeah, you um, so it, it kind of covers all kinds of things. There's prayers for ourselves, for our faithful service with God. There's prayers for our nation, prayers for COVID, prayers for families and households, um, prayers for all kinds of things with an invitation to folks to go through and find your petitions for the day. I like so that. you can pray an entire cycle for a week and then move on to the next cycle, or you can take one petition from each of the cycles and pray for one thing. But over the course of the 40 days, you will have prayed for all kinds of things and conditions um, in our world. And that was kind of the idea because it ties us deeply to our neighbors um, so that we are remembering to pray for everyone um, and not just kind of praying for the things that are close to us, yes. but remembering to pray for all of the things that are not close to us that we might otherwise forget that yeah. we need to pray for. Yeah, and you actually uh, emailed me the PDF of that. So if anybody <laughs> wants that, they can just email me and then I can get them the, the PDF mm -hmm. of that. But I love, I thought that was such a beautiful way to incorporate prayer and then almost having that, that cycle formula, mm -hmm. you know, just to keep going through mm -hmm. and through and through. I really, really loved that yeah. idea. Yeah. And I love that how unique that is to, and did you write this? Um, some of these came from our Book of Common Prayer, okay. but some of them are prayers that I wrote. Okay. Um, COVID prayers, yeah. <laughs> anything yeah. for COVID time <laughs> and stuff like that. Yes. Those are prayers that I actually wrote. That's really um, neat. Just to kind of remind us yeah. that there are so many people suffering, even if we haven't been touched. Mm -hmm. And uh, now, now something you're doing that's unique for Lent. I loved what you, if you don't mind sharing with us. Oh yeah, so so <laughs> I've always been a writer. Okay. Like even from high school. Okay. Um, I've always been a writer. That's that's kind of how I process and how I I do stuff. And 2020 uh, gave me an opportunity to do some fresh new writing. Um, so I had some things that were actually published in Christian Century. Um, but when I finished my doctoral work, my doctor of ministry degree, um, several of the professors who had been kind of working with me and, and watching over my shoulder while I was working on that were like, you really do need to finish this up and turn it into a book. Like you, you really need to do this. And so I, I came home and thought, how do I do that? How do I, how do I faithfully turn this into a book? And got, got started on it in, in earnest. And I realized when 2020 came, the reason I had not finished that was because God clearly wanted me to have some different perspective mm -hmm. that I would not have had mm -hmm. um, apart from COVID. Mm -hmm. I, I needed that layer. So one of the things that I'm doing during Lent intentionally is, is writing every day. Um, I have a children's book that hopefully will be coming out this year. I have a second children's book that I'm working with someone on now that hopefully will be coming out, if not by the end of this year, early next year. Um, and this grown-up book on race <laughs> and the church, yes. um, I, 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 it may be finished next yeah. year. So um, I, I, I ended up with a lot more to say. Mm. Um, <laughs> Especially after this year. After this year, yes. because, because if, if nothing else helped lay bare for us mm. um, disparities between racial and ethnic communities in our country, this pandemic did. Mm. And we immediately saw um, in those early days just decimation in um, the African-American community in particular mm -hmm. and the Hispanic community yes. also. Um, that was just, no, nobody could see that coming or at least they, people said they couldn't see that coming. And when the meat processing plant down in Mississippi, the chick, I guess they were a chicken processing plant, when they had to close, mm -hmm. Um, temporarily, the people who were affected by that were all Hispanic folks. Hmm. Um, and because so many of them had COVID and they had just taken it home where multiple generations were living in a single household. It was just, it was, I mean, they had a precious child who was photographed. I think USA Today may have photographed that precious child. Um, one of the parents had died and the other parent was in the hospital with COVID. And this precious child is like just sitting um, by herself 
And it's like, oh my gosh, who is, I mean, I know somebody is going to take care of this child, but how did we not have any kind of protective equipment for our essential workers? How were we caught so off guard um, for being able to take care of people who take care of all of us? Um, and a lot of those people are people of color. Um, when you start looking at grocery workers and transportation workers and LPNs and I mean just all kinds of folks whose job it is to take care of all the rest of us, mm -hmm. um, those are a lot of people of color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I want that book. <laughs> <laughs> I do. We're probably going to have to have you back on the green chair once you get that book finished to talk about that book. Yeah. So that will be really great. I, I'm really excited about that. And, you know, what I think is so unique about that is, you know, we talk about giving things up, and that's what I was talking to you about. I mean, you're the first person I've had a conversation with that you're, like, committing to doing this task. Like, you're ad essentially adding on something that you want to be diligent in for this 40 days, but it's something that you really deeply feel like God has called you to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think that's a really unique perspective on things that we can be doing for Lynn is being intentional on, look, God has been nudging me on this. I even like going back to your, your priest story yeah. of mm -hmm. becoming a priest, right? Is God's nudging you, nudging you, nudging you. Well, you're taking this 40 days to say, well, I'm actually going to invest in this and I'm going to commit these 40 days to, to doing the work for, yeah. for that. So I think that's really neat. I, mm -hmm. I really like that, that you're doing that. Uh, so one of the things we're doing for this Lenten series uh, of Green Chair Conversations is answering questions from our congregation. Mm -hmm. And so I got one question I think I would, I would love to hear your perspective on. Um, the question is, are there any tips or tricks or mindsets for keeping your Lenten practice? Uh, anything that can help us keep going? I feel like a lot of our people are, I'm, people are reaching out to me about how do I keep going with this? Because this is a, we're taking on a lot or changing a lot um, just kind of tips that can help us keep going yeah this is like that New Year's resolution thing <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I'm gonna work out for an hour every day yes. right wrong yes. <laughs> uh, um, so I, I think one of the one of the things that I have suggested to our parish family anyway is that if we remember to pray if we actually remember to do this if yes. we grab this and go okay today is a good day for me to pray these prayers mm -hmm. um, that becomes a reminder to us to do that other little piece, mm -hmm. which is actually being grounded in the Word. Um, so as a parish, we are reading Mark's Gospel, and we have chunks of Mark's Gospel that we can read every day, and I'm posting just little short lessons, very short, <laughs> very short lessons, because everybody is Zoomed out, yes, virtualed yeah. out, yes. Uh, so the lessons are meant to be like 15-minute kind of lessons, but it, it will focus on one particular thing, probably from that week's reading from Mark, and say, what is God telling us about this? So if I can pray, and then I can remember to go back every night and spend 15, 20 minutes in the Word. Hmm. Once a week, go back and spend 15 minutes having a piece of that really illumined for me. Hmm. Then hopefully that's also going to remind me that there's a giant world out there that I have a way of impacting. Hmm and helping, helping to be God's hands and heart on this earth um, to support somebody else mm. who is in need. And if we can do those things, which really is grounded in prayer, mm -hmm. if we can do those things during the course of these 40 days, I think everybody's relationship with God mm. would be greatly improved. Yes. Um, yeah. If we could do nothing but remember to pray. Yes. If we could just do that for yeah. 40 days yeah. and say, that's really all I got. I, I don't have anything else, but I can remember to pray for 40 days. Yeah. Um, even that will increase our faith and um, help us in our own walk with God. I like that because essentially you're saying it's almost cyclical, right? Mm -hmm. So if you start with one thing, because I think sometimes we make it so big, mm -hmm. right? We make it, it's this huge, like you're saying, New Year's resolution, I'm going to work out for an hour. But if you start with something simple, something needed, prayer, and then it kind of is almost a trigger effect of the mm -hmm. other things or whatever it is that we're, we're right. trying to focus on, it's a, it triggers those. Yes. And so because just start, I'm praying start and then I'm something. thinking. Mm -hmm. It will only take me 15 minutes to read whatever I'm supposed to read today from Mark. So yeah. let, me, let me open up my, my Bible and yeah. let me read for 15 minutes. Yeah. And I like that you scale it back to like, if we can just even pray, like it's not about these million, like it's not necessarily mm -hmm. about even writing every single day or doing these things every single day that we're supposed to be doing. If we can come back to prayer, which is so foundational to mm -hmm. our, our spiritual growth and development, um, I, I think 
we're doing okay. Yes. <laughs> I think we're so hard on ourselves too, you know, but I, I think we, I think that's a fantastic place to, to place to start. And the idea behind these prayers also is to help put the creator's image mm. on the face of our neighbors, because yes. particularly last year, we also became a very polarized country. Yes. And we stopped seeing the hand of the creator in our neighbors. We just started seeing enemy mm. in our neighbors rather than looking at our neighbors and saying, we may not agree on something philosophical or ideological, but that doesn't mean that you are not also a child of God. Mm. Yeah. And we've gotten a long way away from that, and we need to return yep. to that place of being able to see the hand of the Creator in all of us and saying, yeah, that's a child of God. I may not agree with that child of God on everything, but that is still a child of God who is yeah. worthy of me respecting the mm -hmm. dignity of that human being. Mm. Amen to that. Uh, okay, so any final thoughts, reminders, anything you'd want to leave us with today? Um, pray. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's so, I, I, I feel like that's one of the things that we're trying to lean into with our um, sermon series. What we're doing is we're leaning into prayer and different kinds of prayers. And I just, I really do, I'm, I'm with you on that, is it's so foundational to, to our life and our growth and even just what you're saying is basic like 101, right? Like see everybody in the, like as a child of God, but it's so hard right now. And I think that prayer it's, just For some us. people it's become impossible. Yeah, yep. Um, and and that's, that's been one of the most disappointing things to me um, because I, I do feel like that's very historical, that, that we've gone through periods in history where we've been unable to see God in other human beings. And so it feels like we've just kind of made this cycle historically to another place where we just can't, can't even bring ourselves to say, that is my neighbor. That's, that's why Jesus told that parable of the Good Samaritan. That is my neighbor, even the one I want to hate. Yep. 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 And that's, I mean, greatest commandment, right? I mean, it's just... It's love God, love neighbor. Yeah, it goes right back to that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you today. for the invitation. I'm so glad to be with you. This is a huge blessing. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and that is a wrap for our Green Chair Conversation with Dorothy Wells. Thank you so much for being here with us. Remember, today's conversation doesn't have to end here. I would love to connect with you. I would love to hear your thoughts about today's conversation or even topics or people you want to hear from. So feel free to send me an email. Also, we would love for you to take a moment and encourage someone today by sharing this conversation. You can also watch any previous conversations at hopechurchmemphis.com slash GCC or YouTube, as well as listen on any podcast apps. Love you guys, and I'll see you next week. <laughs>